we we need good afternoon to everybody we need to wait some seconds in order that uh, everyone can join us and uh, we will start very soon uh, we have uh, two important speakers uh, and for sure a lot of registration for sure we will have even uh, uh, tonight a great webinar Again, good evening to everybody. We are uh, uh, more than 100, but for sure we, as I told you, we received a lot of registration. We, uh, we are uh, going to start a new series of uh, uh, ESSM uh, uh, webinars. I'm Giovanni Corona, the president-elect of the society. I'm speaking, about, I'm speaking on behalf of our president, Carlo Bettotti, and the chair of uh, the scientific committee, Mikkel Fodd, who will join us uh, in a few uh, minutes. Just few information before uh, entering in the uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank IPSA for supporting uh, this kind of uh, uh, educational activity. Uh, this is the first one, uh, but for sure we will have uh, another one uh, in July and probably another one after summer period. Uh, so just few information, as I told you, the topic is very, very hot topic, sexual dysfunction post SSRI and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So we have two great speakers, uh, Kobe Reisman, the, um, pres the past presidents of our society and one of the most active member uh, of our society. He published a lot uh, on this topic and for sure he will try to uh, simplify and to give us uh, important uh, practical information on uh, uh, the management of this kind of patients. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Michael Ustarovic from Poland, a member of the scientific committee and again a member involved in several activities of our society is a psychiatric from uh, uh, Poland, so for sure he can uh, give us uh, uh, the right information regarding to how manage the uh, post uh, uh, SSRI uh, sexual problems. So just uh, some information on behalf of our presidents uh, regarding our educational activity. Um, we are going to have uh, in presence uh, ESSM school, uh, uh, in Budapest next 18 to 27 of uh, November. Uh, so again, uh, we uh, will have uh, the basic school and the advanced school. So you can go to our website uh, in order to try all information in order to uh, apply uh, for the um, school and some uh, uh, position are still uh, available. Another important topic, another important project of our society is the SSM Academy of Genital Surgery. We have uh, launched the live webinars last uh, um, uh, in, uh, from September to uh, December of 2021. Uh, textbook and video library is still available and now we have in the level three. So the center of uh, excellence and the use of uh, this uh, innovative model, so the 3D model uh, regarding this important uh, project. So again, if you want to have uh, more information, uh, go to our website. Another important information is uh, uh, related to the exams. Uh, again, after the uh, COVID situation, we are going to have the exams. Uh, next uh, April, there will be a, um, a course in order to uh, have uh, the correct preparation for the exams. Uh, the exams uh, uh, next year will be uh, uh, online. Uh, in the June uh, application will start. So again, um, uh, go to our website to have more information regarding the exams. 
Then we have uh, still available our manuals uh, on sexual medicines and the syllables on clinical sexology, and nowadays also the textbooks on surgery. Uh, so the books are available for all members of the society, and we are uh, working on the uh, update version of the manual of sexual medicines and the syllables on clinical sexology. So as I told you, the next webinar will be uh, the 7th of July. So again, go to our website and register for uh, another important topic, another important webinar. So final information, uh, we hope for sure and convinced about it that we'll have the Rotterdam face-to-face -face meeting next February 16, 18. So please uh, start since today to book these dates uh, to have a great Congress in presence in Rotterdam. So I'm finished. Uh, now we, have, we are more than 140 people. So it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, uh, Kobe Reisman, that is going to give uh, a fantastic uh, talk on uh, uh, five alpha reductase and post finasteride symptoms. Uh, so, um, Kobe, please. Thank you, uh, Giovanni. Uh, good evening to all our participants from Europe and good day for the participants from other parts, a special welcome to our participants from Ukraine that are show that they are also participants. And this evening I will talk about the post-finasteride syndrome. I published more about PSSD, but uh, I will try to explain all the aspects related to this uh, uh, syndrome. I don't have any conflict of interest related to this uh, subject. And before we start, I have already a full question to you, audience. It's not right or wrong, but I would like to know your uh, uh, opinion if PFS is a physical or mental uh, condition or both of them. Please vote. Thank you very much for voting. Let's just wait a few seconds more so that we have time for everyone to think about it and vote. Okay, just a few seconds and then I will share the results. Marvelous. It's clear that uh, a lot of our audience are uh, well educated on the biopsychosocial aspects. And indeed, we believe that uh, PFS is a mental and physical condition that I will show you if it's caused or not caused by the finasteride in a moment. So let's stop sharing and start with what I will talk about. I will start with the con and pro of PFS, very short, explain what are five alpha reductase and what are the inhibitors and the effects. And uh, we will follow on the criteria for PFS, the clinical presentation and what kind of evidence we have for it and a management proposal for all the physicians and therapists uh, among the audience. So the con about PFS. If you look in the literature, there are some articles who say that PFS doesn't exist. Mainly they argued from results of ad hoc analysis of the prostate cancer prevention trial, trial who said that there were low incidence of sexual adverse side effects. It will resolve with the uh, with, with uh, continuous of the treatment and there is no serious adverse events. So they claim that PFS doesn't exist. And this is also supported by the, uh, let's say, phase three randomized trial of finasteride, uh, who show limited sexual side effects. But actually, don't forget that the prostate cancer prevention trial was aimed on older age male population. In 2019, this article, which is expert opinion published, and they asked themselves, is PFS not an delusional disorder? But pay attention. It's a dermatological uh, uh, journal with all the experts dermatologists. So 
be aware of what people publish sometimes. But for the con of the pro, sorry, uh, is a mistake here. I only show you what the FDA decided on the labeling of finasteride and actually Sweden and UK uh, adopted this recommendation, EMA not, EMA adopted the recommendation on PSSD that Michal will talk about it. And it stated clearly for the case of Propertia finasteride one milligram that there are certainly sexual disorders, libido, ejaculation, organs that continue after the discontinuation of the drugs. For the labeling of uh, finasteride five milligram, the proscar, the only mention decreased libido that may continue after uh, discontinuation. And in case of both medication, both doses, there are clearly some reports of male infertility or pure, uh, pure semen quality that will improve after drug discontinuation. And this is important because a lot of young guys get Popetia in asteroid and are not aware of the impact on fertility of those drugs. So what is 5-alpha reductase? Actually, it's an en enzyme with three iso forms of, uh, in, in the brain, in the air follicles, in the prostate, and actually everywhere in our body. Well, type two is clearly present in the uh, air and the prostate as well, which is relevant for the indication of this medication. And there is higher affinity of actually both finasteride and dutasteride, another 5-alpha reductase for this is a form of enzymes. Everyone in the medical world, at least, and certainly in the urological and endocrinological, know that 5-alpha reductase actually uh, take care about from the formation of dehydrotestosterone from testosterone. And testosterone is made from cholesterol. But not all the people know that it's not the only a function of this enzyme. It's also involved in the formation of dehydroprogesterone and dehydrotestosterone even have part in the formation of the free alpha DO, which have impact on the estrogen receptor. So those steroid hormones, even narrow steroid, narrow uh, steroid hormones, are having an impact on two very major receptors in our brain. And these receptors, don't know why my slide don't go further, I will go like that. These hormones have not only endocrine function in all our body, they have also parocrine and autocrine effect in our brain, in the cells near and in the cell where they are produced. So these neurosteroid hormones have tremendous effect in our brain, brain. And the GABA receptors and the sigma receptors and the calcium uh, channels have an impact on our mood, pain experience, biorhythm, how we react to stress, and our sleep patterns, our memory, anxiety, coping with anxiety, and sexual function. So when we see this, we can in a few moments realize actually what the tremendous effect of such a, 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 a compound as, as finasteride may have and the side effects of it. And as I said, finasteride is actually a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. We have also detosteride, this is another type, which is mainly on one and two, finasteride only on the isoinform two, and is actually a middle uh, is actually a drug that already are available from the beginning of the 90s for the BPH, the prostate enlargement, and since 97 for the androgenic alopecia or baldness. It's a steroid. It's blocked the enzyme, the 5-alpha reductase. It's very potent for the isoform 2, and it's lipophilic, which means that it crosses the blood-brain barrier it can reach our brain. And beside the effect on the prostate and our air growth, we have physical and 
anti-androgenic, this anti-testosterone effect on all our body. And as I said, in the production and other narrow steroids in our brain and body. If you look in the medical indication of finasteride, there is large amount of males who may be candidate for the use of these drugs. 60% of the males when they became 60, having prostate enlargement, and 40% of them will have complaints. And 50% of the Caucasian men have AGA. So think how many people have the potential of use of these drugs. I will not extend on all the study on the side effects of finasteride, but I only use the publication related to the adverse event reporting system of the FDA. And as you can see, there are clearly sexual adverse events, physical adverse events, and psychological ones, including depression and suicidal thoughts. And the, the a side effect may persist for a long time after stopping the drugs and may induce PFS. For some reason, those side effects appear more on right-handed than left-handed. We don't have any clear explanation on it. And there is ongoing discussion who have more side effects, the one who use the one milligram or the one who use five milligrams or the older population. And it's going back forward and forward in publication in the literature. In any case, when we look at experiments on rats in the laboratory, it's clearly that finasteride will arm the erection of a rat by less response for the nerve stimulation, but deposition of a collagen, which will destroy the structure actually, and the copper carbonose have even lower weight when compared to control. Not only that, one of the most important things is the intracavernosal pressure changes when they use the dutasteride, the other uh, five upper reductase. And you see that even after six weeks and two weeks without the drugs, clearly decrease in the intracavernosal pressure, so less stiff erections with these drugs. This is on red. So what caused those side effects of finasteride? And I'm not talking in PFS in general where they use it. There is decrease in the DHT, which effectively actually reduced the level of nitric oxide in the corpus cavernosum, and nitric oxide is crucial for erection mechanism, and they change the architecture of the corpora. Not only that, we have large number of studies who show that there is change in the neurosteroids, the one that I show you in the beginning of the presentation, in the cerebral spinal fluids and also in the plasma. And when you take it out, even in rats, they decrease pleasure-seeking behavior. We are not rats, human, but you see some similarity with the side effects that we have. And if I summarize what all the studies on animals show us, that finasteride will have brain, it will have effect on our brain, or our on the rat's brain, sorry, on the circulation, on the reproduction, in the behavior, on the kidney function, and also on the microbiomes of the our intestines, on the colon. So there is a lot of effect on rats in experimental models. Now a question to you. Is gynecomastia a diagnostic features of post-finasteride synd syndrome? Uh, Daniela, can you let the participant vote? So we will yet wait another few seconds. Thank you everybody for voting. I can see that almost uh, all of the attendees are voting. Just another few seconds and then I will close uh, the poll and share the results. Now, 
almost 50-50 say that it's true or false. And I will show you in a moment what we mean by that. Okay. Last year, David Ayeli and another 20 experts, I was one of them and Michal was also one of them, published a consensus paper in Journal of Medical Risks, Drug Risk, let's uh, say, uh, about the PFS criteria and PSSD criteria. And it's clear that the criteria say, pair your treatment with finasteride or lutasteride, and during sexual dysfunction after stopping the treatment and at least three months of stopping the treatment, there is reduction on sexual desire, erectile dysfunction to some extent, and genital and orgasmic sensation. And there is no evidence of pre-drug sexual dysfunction or any medical condition or drugs or substance that will explain these symptoms. There may be also cognitive impairment, depression, and even suicide thoughts. The futures of gynecomastia is a side effect of finasteride, and it's not pathogenomic for PFS. So it can appear, sometimes disappear, sometimes not, and this is not pathogenomic for the PFS. And the same go for the change in the sperm quality and quantity as well. So remember, if the patient will complain of the, and gynecomastia is a future feature of the use of finasteride, but a not pathogenomic for PFS. What are the symptoms of PFS? Actually, we can divide them according to all the studies in five groups. The physical one, which gynecomastia is one of them, but it's not path pathogenomic. Fatigue is the second most prevalent from this category. The sexual one with decreased sex drive and erectile dysfunction. And I will show you in a moment another two, very important. Concerning the pen penis and the testicles, diminish ejaculation volume, complain of 80% of the patient uh, uh, we will see in clinical practice. They have complain of mental cloudiness, brain fogs in 75% of them, and also almost 75% of them complain about anxiety and 66% about depression. 63% of them will talk about suicidal thoughts because of their situation or because of the depression. And one of the most, let's say, strange complaint that we hear is the lack of connection between the brain and the penis. Very pathogenomic complaint of the PFS population and also of the PSSD, and I will show you in a moment. But don't forget, all the publications are self-reported patients, short follow-ups, and there are no prospective cohort with that respect. So we always need to examine those features. Just to show you one of the nicest studies of Erwig in JSM 2012, and he measure what the people say in retrospective about their sexual situation and the higher the score, the ASIC scores who more complain, how it's, they complain during the interview when they come with complaint of PFS and with follow up between nine to 16 months. And you can see that all the part of the sexual response cycle are affected, including the orgasmic satisfaction. So there is tremendous impact on those patients on all the sexual uh, domains. What's going on with the neurosteroids in the CSF and, and in the sperm? And as you can see in these figures, that there is tremendous change in all the neurosteroids and the plasma concentration not always correspond with the CSF con co uh, concentration. This is very important to realize that what we measure in blood is not the same what's happening in the brain. And of course, we cannot do by each patient lumbar function to know what is going on. So, but this is an indication. And as you can see, even the progesterones are high in this patient population. So if 
I summarize because I don't have the all time to show all the evidence that we have. We have alternation in the levels of the neuroactive steroids, as I show you in a, a few moments. There is a, a, a gene polymorphism of the endogenic uh, receptors. There is epigenetic modification. There are even abnormal brain MRI signals in, relate, in relation related to sexual arousal. There are other sexual dysfunction, as I show you, depressive symptoms, almost 75% of the patient, increased odd ratio of suicide thoughts of sexuality, certainly in the young males, less than 45 years old, upregulation of the androgenic receptor in the foreskin, the, the pupils of the penis, abnormal cavernosal penile Doppler uh, duplex ultrasound results, uh, certainly low flow and some what called venous leak, uh, dysfunction of the corpora, and even the evoked potential of the pudendal nerve when it's checked with EMG so show different, uh, different results comparing to control. So there is tremendous impact after the use of finasteride in a subset of patients. And this is not homogeneous group, is different. And we don't know yet who will be the one who may suffer from these results. What about PFS in women? Actually, we don't have any publication about PFS in uh, uh, in women, but we do know that some women use finasteride of label for, for alopecia. There is in the adverse event registration of the FDA, as you can see, abortion, cervix stenosis, fatigue, arthritis, headache, libido loss, and it's certainly forbidden during pregnancy because it could cause genital ambiguity, DSDs, and uh, actually, boys who were bur uh, 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 born as female and get virilized at puberty. So this is dangerous drugs during pregnancy. One slide will show some similarity between PFS and PSSD patient. And you can see the yellow and the gray often or always reporting of lack of connection between the brain and the penis, very pathogenic for those two syndromes. As you see, the yellow almost always is both group of patients and the same goal for genital numbness on those group of patients. Another pathogenic complaint of patients, certainly with PSSD and also with PFS. But remember that we have some evidence about similarities, but these are not completely the same syndrome and certainly comparing to the mechanism that may cause the side effects. And now for the important part, the management of the patients. How to deal with these guys who come to our clinics? Remember that majority of them already consult at least two or three physicians, psychiatrists who told them you don't have nothing. It's all in your mind. So they are very frustrated. They are sometimes desperate with a lot of fear because anxiety appears a lot of the time. They have the tendency to catastrophizing everything. Is it because of the depression or the anxiety or because of the drugs? We don't know. And it has tremendous impact on the daily life and in the quality of life. So try to build trust. Even if you don't know how to manage, if you see that there is clear symptoms who approach the criteria, tell them that you see something and tell them that you believe them and tell them that you're working with them to find some solution. We don't always find the solution. Have patience and certainly give hope. For people with fear, with depression, giving hope is hanging on the life. And that's very important. Take profound history. Sexual one, how it was before the drug, how it was during the drug, and after discontinuation of the drug, and the time is certainly of importance. The same goes for the sexual 
history and the psychological one. And if you are not able to do it all by yourself, consult your colleague. You have around you a psychologist, you have a sexologist, and you can collaborate together. Remember, biopsychosocial. It's very important to do the laboratory test, at least the hormonal profile, and it's not enough to check testosterone. Think about the SHBG, think about the LH, FSH, thyroid function, and if you have the ability with your lab to do plasma neurosteroids, I will recommend including progesterone and estrogens, estrogens in males. Unfortunately, we don't have good normal range of values and use questionnaires, sexual function, IAF or SX, whatever you prefer that you give you an instrument, the same go for the break, depression scale or whatsoever, because you will be able to show your patient where they are standing by the beginning of the treatment and in the follow-up visits that they have, because sometimes they have tendency to catastrophize and you will maybe be able to show them, look, you improve there, you improve there, and that make a difference, certainly. So approach in biopsychial approach, try to improve their wellness by treating their symptoms. And I give here some example in anxiety with antidepressant or anxiolytics or psychotherapy and CBTs, sexual dysfunction with medication and sex therapy as well, and healthy lifestyle. And remember, sexual dysfunction may lead to depression and depression will lead to sexual dysfunction. It be directional. And if we can improve one of them, we will have higher chance of impact on the other part, the sexual dysfunction or the depression. So be aware of both of them. So if I look, I'm trying to have impact on my patient on the brain and the genitals. And I start with lifestyle, exercise, healthy food, no drugs, regular sleeping, antidepressant, and certainly the one with the less sexual side effect like metazapine, for example, or bipropion. There are some publication on the use of vitamin D, which improves sperm parameters, and vitamin E about the condition. Vitamin D anyhow is good against depression and uh, feeling better. Some uh, uh, publication on L-arginine and l carnitine which improve nitric oxide uh, in that respect, symptomatic treat medication for the erectile dysfunction, PD-5 inhibitor, sometimes even intercovenous or injection, and use psychotherapy, sex therapy, and motivation interviewing. Remember, to motivate and depress patients to go into lifestyle, need a lot of patients. So I use a lot of time principle of motivational interview. And I always use them what I call the pleasure principle. Do something that will give you good feeling even for two minutes a day. Write it in a day, day book to show them that there are things that they can enjoy and the good enough sex because you will hear here all the time before the finasteride, it was marvelous. Everything was great and it's not gotten back. And if they were expect in a month time to get back to what it was before, they will always be disappointed. So the good enough sex is very important principle. See, you are improving, it's getting better. That will make already change. But again, evidence for what I'm saying here in the management principle, I need a magnifying glass to find it. And we're still working on a trial and trying to have randomized style as well, but it's very difficult uh, with these patients in group. So this is my approach with this patient. So in conclusion, we then have limited amount of information in evidence, in evidence. Remember that a large amount of the population may use this medication. We need to know, understand, and know what we are doing with these patients and certainly in the subset of men with AGA, they are prone or they have more chance of getting those issues and use multimodal approach with your patient with a lot of empathy and sympathy and curiosity to them. And I just want to remind what Giovanni already said on behalf of our president, Carlo Betoki, we have the ESSM school in November. We will talk also about this syndrome. 
and you are certainly invited to Rotterdam to our meeting that we will be face to face in Rotterdam. So it will be certainly great. And if I may promote one book that will uh, uh, appear in a month time, which have also two chapters dealing with PFS and PSSD. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Kobe, for your presentation. Um, maybe can we now invite uh, um, Mikhail Lechtarovitz to share his screen and start uh, his presentation. Thank you so much. And let me just remind uh, the audience, if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A that you find on your dashboard. Mikhail, the floor. Uh, yes, yes, the thank is you. Yours. Just, just a moment, yes. Okay, I hope you can see it now. So, uh, can good you afternoon. Put it in the presentation yeah. mode, just. Uh, yeah, sure. To make it clear. Okay, so it doesn't work now. Just a moment. It is in the presentation mode. And. We tried it before, okay. so it must be. Yeah, yeah, we tried it before, so it should work right now, yeah? Mm, it's actually still uh, um, as it was before. Oh, really? Yeah, we can see I'm, the I'm bar sorry on the left-hand side. Just one more try. Okay. How about now? Uh, no, that's even worse. <laughs> I think it worked before. Why it doesn't work right now? No, not. So that's perfect. Oh, it, it was, was perfect. It was perfect. Yes. Okay, so let's try to Just repeat this success again. No. Yeah, is it fine? No. no. No, really. But it was the same option, really. So it's very. If you want, I can share my screen with your presentation. If you okay, that's perfect now. Okay, now, so perfect. I don't touch anything <laughs> anymore. Okay, 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 thank you, thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for your patience, everyone. Let's start. Okay, I'm psychiatrist, so I have to be patient somehow. Uh, so good, good evening, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning for some of you. I seen uh, in the audience there are people from all around the world. I'm very happy about this. It's not an easy task for me to talk after uh, Kobe Reisman, who is an excellent speaker. And I'm sure you will see that um, our presentation uh, in some point will slightly overlap uh, as these are uh, uh, quite, quite similar syndromes I'm gonna talk about. Uh, but now, okay, I have to move forward the presentation, okay. Uh, so here are my disclosures. I don't have any particular conflict of interest regarding this topic I'm gonna present. And uh, first let's put the antidepressants in the perspective. Um, these are more and more widely used drugs worldwide. If you look at the OECD statistics, uh, comparison from the year 2000 and 2013, you will see that the uh, worldwide use of antidepressant has doubled. Uh, so these are really, really huge numbers. And uh, the anti antidepressants are started seeing, see, to be seen as kind of lifestyle medications that would wash your troubles away. So they are also not only like antidepressant treatment, but treatment for everyday uh, troubles and stressful situations. Um, which is actually not, not the clinical indication, of course, but they are more and more widely used. And they are also prescribed in very young people, so in children, they can be prescribed since six years old, and they are also prescri prescribed in pregnant women and perceived as relatively uh, safe you know, therapeutic options for different mood uh, and anxiety-related problems. So, uh, and... We don't have too much studies uh, with longer follow-up. What 
happens with people after the treatment is being discontinued. So these are the, still the dark fields in the research. As, as I told you, they are very widely used and they also have many registered indications such as depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder or different uh, so, uh, sorts of uh, anxiety disorders. Dapoxetine is also registered in premature ejaculation, but they have many off-label registrations such as postmenopausal syndromes, hot flashes, chronic fatigue syndrome, or also the off-label use of other than dapoxetine in SSRIs uh, to uh, cope with premature ejaculation. And uh, uh, as you can see on the other, uh, on the graph, so the, these are the market leaders now. So the, uh, the highly selective drugs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, I take, are taking the lead. They are more and more commonly used and they are on the up uh, as compared with other drugs. On the other hand, we have the patient's point of view and uh, and these points of view are quite commonly shared in the internet. So the antidepressants and especially SSRIs has, uh, have a very non-sexy image in the web. And they are perceived as medication that will uh, stop you feeling uh, sexy, aroused. They will stop your sexual desire and you will get warned that some of these condition can become permanent. So. What, what do we know about this? And what are the causes of, of uh, problems, uh, sexual problems related with, with antidepressants? Uh, probably most of you are very familiar with the dual control model, the sexual tipping point, uh, which uh, shows that our sexual excitation or inhibition uh, our drive is uh, highly impacted by, by the factors that are stimulatory and some other factors that are inhibitory. And within the brain, we are highly affected by neurotransmitters and uh, serotonin is perceived uh, and well investigated as the major inhibitory compound. So the higher serotonergic activity is, the more sexual inhibition we have. So we can say that in uh, in the, the most similar way we can see it. And this is, this, this is happening through the uh, serotonergic receptors, especially the 5-HT2 and 5-HT3, which are the major targets for, uh, for uh, un serotonergic antidepressants. On the other hand, we have dopaminergic system that is the the excitatory one, so the, the prom sex, uh, sex behavior, desire, sexual pressure promoting uh, monoamine uh, together with noradrenaline and also uh, the, the, the compounds that will work through the, uh, the outer receptor 5-HT1A serotonergic receptor agonism, they will also have much less of sexual side effects. So we can really um, so what we have to do, we have to look thoroughly into the mechanism of action of these compounds to predict whether they will have more or less sexual dysfunction. Looking into metal analysis, the most well known uh, from 13 years ago by Soretti and Chiesa, would show you that uh, most, the most popular drugs uh, among antidepressants are the ones that are very, very likely to cause sexual dysfunction. So you have like up from five to more than 20 times uh, more likely uh, to become uh, sexual dysfunctional taking these medications. And this is also another problem in clinical practice that uh, these are very bothersome adverse effects and uh, it, uh, it, uh, it is highly related with patient non-adherence, one of the most common reasons for discontinuation of the treatment. It is estimated that nine from 10 patients that will discover these side effects will stop the treatment prematurely. Looking a little bit more into detail, you can see that these uh, drugs usually, if they 
affect uh, sexual well-being badly, so they affect sexual dysfunction, they will act on the, all the phases of sexual response cycle, most of them, but for some of them, it may be uh, a little bit more differentiated. So there are some drugs that will more affect desire and organs, but less, in less extent, the physiological, the genital arousal, and also the other way around. Um, and this is clearly related with the mechanism. So, so the, 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 the likelihood, the, the uh, antidepressant will cause sexual dysfunction. This is highly related with the level of affinity to serotonergic receptors, the, the, uh, how, how much they affect the, the serotonin transporter or whether they act through different mechanisms like uh, receptor modulators or, or uh, dopamine uh, reuptake inhibitors, etc. And I think this is the moment we should uh, have our poll questions. So Daniela, can you show it to us? Thank you. So the first question is, now we are going to talk about the post-SSRI. Uh, sexual dysfunction. What is the most common symptom of post uh, PSSD, as we call it? Is it the decreased sexual desire, decreased tactile genital sensation, erectile and orgasmic dysfunction, or genital pain? If you have uh, listened carefully to Kobe Reisman's talk, I think you could notice this information already. So please vote. Thank you very much. Just like we did before, we just allow a few more seconds before I close the poll and share the results. Okay, so I think I'm gonna repeat some crucial information in uh, my few uh, next slides, but now it will be time for, for, for another question. So please question number two, what are the symptoms of PSSD or how they occur, whether they may occur as early as with the first dose of antidepressant? or typically begin a few weeks after antidepressant discontinuation and last for several months of, or years, or they usually start when the antidepressant dose reach at least half of the maximal dose and persist as until its discontinuation, or they maintain up to five half year lives of the medication after its discontinuation. Okay, I can see participants are voting. Let's just allow a few seconds so that there's enough time to read all the possible answers and vote. So thank you very much. I will now stop and share the results. Okay, thank you. So as you can see, the answers are very diverse and uh, these are not very easy questions. And uh, I can show you this in within the next slide. So can we close this already? Close the window, please. All right, so now, what the PSSD is, uh, this is called persistent sexual side effects after discontinuation of SSRIs, or maybe it will be, it, will, it should be even more, uh, more precisely defined as side effect after discontinuation of uh, SRIs. So it doesn't have to be always selective, but the symptoms usually appear days or weeks after beginning of SSRI treatment, they can, really appear as early as, as uh, even if in an hour or a few hours, which is um, usually very surprising both for the patient and uh, many times it also affects uh, uh, some, uh, some doubts in clinician that, that, that uh, is, um, uh, is hearing this kind of complaint, but it may, may be as early as even hours after beginning of the medication. 
and they may persist even many years after this continuation. And the, another important thing is that they are related not only with high distress, but when I see this patient, I, I see this, it, we can even see it as a kind of a trauma. Uh, surely the trauma is also related with what happened next because they very often complain about this unexpected adverse effect. And even when they stop the medication, this dysfunction persists. And they very often experience that, that nobody, no clinician, they, they are meeting or they are vis visiting changing physicians, changing uh, doctors. They don't believe in that complaint. This is a very common uh, narr narrative by the patients. At a given moment, we have the growing literature on the subject. There's also, as you can see, one a publication by Kobe Reisman and the, another uh, publication on steer on its way and they are appearing. In fact, not only SSRIs, but also all the other drugs that affect serotonin reuptake and they increase serotonergic activity within the brain may cause this relatively, uh, probably relatively rare phenomenon. So these are SSRIs, serotonin, uh, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors called SNRIs, tricyclic antidepressant, but also even SRI uh, active antihistamine or tetracycline antibiotics or tramadol. The real prevalence is something we really don't know. Uh, it's being reported mainly in the case reports and these reports are still increasing. As you could see in 2012, the, the Dutch database um, called LAREP had 19 such reports. Uh, then in the internet service on, uh, on the adverse events in patients that took antidepressant, there were found 23 high probability cases of PSSD. But now uh, the data from the last year, there were all already 1,000 reports, more than 1,000 reports in the American database on a drug adverse event called RxISK. This is the very recently published paper that Kobe already mentioned. This is, uh, and here we also uh, co-authored this, and this is also the work of, of a working group that looks after this um, relatively well, less known adverse effects that chronically, uh, that chronically persist after this discontinuation of SSRIs. In this uh, publication, you can see uh, the proposal of diagnostic criteria because in the absence of a biomarker, these diagnostic criteria might improve both research and the clinical practice. We have to do much more studies on the, the subject and, and uh, know much more about this uh, unexpected condition that might happen during the treatment. What are the necessary criteria so surely patients have to be previously treated with a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but also the most common, and this was also in, the, in your question, uh, this is an enduring change in somatic or tactile of, or erogenous sexual genital, genital sensation after the treatment stops. So it's very, very typical patients are complaining of some kind of genital anesthesia. The additional symptoms include uh, reduction of sexual desire, erectile dysfunction, and ability to orgasm, climax, and, and uh, decreased pl pleasure that is derived from, uh, the or from orgasm. And these, um, these symptoms are present for uh, at least three months after stopping the treatment. In the clinical investigation, it is very important to roll out the, the possibly other conditions that can affect this kind of sexual complaints, including uh, some medical conditions or medications, drug abuse, or, uh, or the evidence of pre-drug sexual dysfunction. Just as Kobe mentioned with the finasteride, some of, pa of patients complaining of these symptoms say that it was perfectly fine before the medication, but if you start investigating this, it, it appears it's not, it's, it is not exactly so. So these are the exclusionary criteria. And there are some ancillary sexual symptoms that it may include the genital pain, uh, reduced nipple sensitivity in similar 
why it is it is being complained about uh, genital anesthesia, and the decreased um, decreased erections, also nocturnals or or morning erections, ejaculatory force or so-called lactic glands during erections or decreased lubrication in females. Also, some other uh, ancillary non-sexual symptoms are being commonly reported, especially the emotional numbing. This is the condition that patients uh, quite often complain of while being treated with SSRIs. And it, it is also seen that emotional and genital numbing commonly go together as one condition. There are several hypotheses, no uh, definitive, definitive um, etiopathogenesis that has been found for the syndrome. And the most common uh, theory is the recept receptor downregulation theory that says that 5-HT receptors stimulation leads to downregulation, especially in 5-HT1A receptors. And this leads also, which, which persists after the discontinuation of the treatment, and it leads further to the potentialization of the serotonin transmission thereafter. And this, as you know, is an inhibitory uh, monoamine and that leads to more sexual dysfunction. What's interesting, uh, it was also found um, in animal studies that uh, sexual motivation was decreased in, uh, in uh, rats that were administered SSRIs when they were young. So later on, they, they were less sexually active and also in offspring of mothers that were receiving SSRIs during pregnancy. And this leads us to, to also to, to prediction that maybe early, uh, early um, exposition to these drugs may affect our uh, future sexual life. So we have to be aware of that. There are also theories on neurohormonal changes, including many other monoamines, uh, neuropeptides, neurosteroids, also nitric oxide, uh, the serotonin neurotoxicity, the neurotoxicity sorry, theory, and the other one that was presented by Marcel Wondinger and, and colleagues. There is um, a hypothesis on, uh, of um, ion potential, so the alteration of receptor potential channel transduction that leads to decreased skin sensitivity. And uh, in case of perinal and pudendal nerve, that would lead to this very uh, typical symptom, sy symptoms of uh, genital uh, numbness or anesthesia. It, it's quite clear that patients should be warned about this, uh, these side effects, not only by physician, but it has to also to, to appear in uh, drug labels. And such a petition was, uh, was submitted to FDA and EMA. Uh, but even, uh, even before, like since 2011, you could see then in the US um, uh, drug label of Prozac, which is Furoxet in one of the SSRI, there is also already a warning about symptoms of sexual dysfunction that may occasionally persist after discontinuation of the treatment. So what can we do if, if our patient complains of this kind of symptoms? We really don't have any guidelines on that. This is still not an established diagnosis. So there are proposed diagnostic criteria, but it's still on, on the level of development. So maybe one day we can see this as a separate diagnosis. The evidence-based data is still very, very poor, but what, what is extremely important is the awareness among clinicians that, it, that this kind of, of condition, this kind of side effect may, uh, may appear and may persist for really long and they could, it could affect very hardly patient sexual satisfaction cause a lot of sexual related distress. Uh, there, there have been, there's been many suggestions what, what can be done. Uh, the most um, prevalent are uh, pointing that we should use medication that are more antagonistic towards 5-HT2 or 3 receptors and 5-HT1A agonists. Actually, there are some medications, some antidepressants that include uh, the 
5-HT1A agonistic activities such as borchioxetine that are that is that is seen actually to affect uh, sexual function much less likely than the typical SSRIs. Uh, in case of a, there is a one separated drug buspiron that can work through this uh, just solely through the 5-HT1A agonism. So maybe this, uh, and it was proposed in case report that it can alleviate a little bit, uh, uh, that can help in, uh, in patients that are complaining of PSSD symptoms. And I have also some uh, personal, uh, so, some, some clinical experience in using this drug in some patients. I may say that, that it helped for some of them quite uh, significantly. Using dopaminergic agonists, uh, you can see that there are questions there because it's not there are not definite study fundings, and uh, bupropion has been proposed an add-on medication to the uh, other uh, antidepressant, serotonergic depressant that may alleviate this way sexual dysfunction. But there is no direct evidence in PSSD for this drug. Mm, definitely, what we can do when we treat patients, or we have to start the treatment again because they are becoming depressive or anxious again. Also, when they have uh, uh, the PSSD symptoms, uh, definitely we should change the medication to another mechanism of action, and uh, definitely not use any more SSRI or any SRI. So, a selective or unselective serotonin reuptake inhibitor is definitely contraindicated. You can use drugs uh, working through melatonergic uh, receptors or other drugs such as amineptin, bupropion, or trazodone that will have less of uh, probability for sexual side effects. And uh, we have to keep in mind that many of the patients are very, very traumatized by this condition. And then they surely need uh, also, uh, they need psychological support, but also many of them would need a separate medication for uh, the depressive symptoms, for anxiety symptoms, and they are very, very afraid of this medication at that time point, which is quite clear. Uh, there were no um, evidence, uh, there's no, no evidence recently about um, improvement for uh, PDA5 inhibitor or adding testosterone. Of course, patients with erectile dysfunction can benefit from adding PDF5 inhibitor, patients with low testosterone levels from adding testosterone, but it doesn't cure entirely the PSSD as a condition. Uh, the intervention that was focused on the, this theory on ion channel transduction uh, the, uh, it was, was the use of uh, low power laser irradiation or, and phototherapy, but it was only a case report that, that uh, the panel sensitivity was improved without significant effect on other symptoms. And what was already very well uh, emphasized by Kobe, we have to look on this uh, situation, on this co specific condition from biopsychosocial perspective, and we have to use many uh, interventions at once. So the non-pharmacological intervention are very important. We have to educate the patient what has happened, uh, what can happen uh, in the future, so what, what can be the course of the, uh, of the uh, condition. They need a lot of support, they need a lot of understanding, so they are really uh, very often they, they are relieved when uh, the clinician really trusts them and uh, sees their complaints are real and not, uh, not paranoid that it was found in some very, uh, some, some old articles even. So, so you can use uh, cognitive behavioral treatment therapies. You can use um, sexual, uh, like sense that focus uh, experience, psychosexual counseling therapy, but clearly uh, use what, uh, remember about the patient trauma and the need to overcome this condition as well. To conclude, we have to raise the awareness of PSSD. We have to discuss this side effect before the treatment starts. And if we have a patient that, that uh, is complaining, or we should ask about this, so the patient that, that has sexual dysfunction during the treatment with antidepressant, 
in the best solution is to consider changing for another antidepressant. My disclosure is that I use this medication and also SSRIs uh, on a daily basis. I use a lot of this medication from different class of drugs, but seeing the sexual side effects in patients who takes SSRIs and as a distressing condition clearly leads to a consideration of changing the medication to completely different mechanism of action of, of the drug. So we have to investigate, we have to look at the exclusion and inclusion criteria for PSSD, as you could see in, in previous slides. And we have to know that we cannot um, say, we cannot uh, say to the patient that it will be all fine, it will or disappear, but we have to give hope. We have to try different modalities as said and uh, use the off-label treatments in order to try to, uh, to make things better, but educate and give support is also at the same level. It's very, very important. So in, in all patients that complain of sexual dysfunction, it's also good to ask about lifetime use of SSRI. So please remember that they might use it much, much uh, earlier and later on the condition of sexual dysfunction may persist. We need much more studies. This is quite obvious. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and uh, thank you also to Kobe. Uh, good evening, everybody. Sorry, I have been late, unfortunately, so I missed the beginner, but I'm sure that uh, Giovanni has introduced uh, basically not only this uh, interesting uh, session that I thank IPSA for giving us the possibility to do it, but also the speakers that are well known and really very friend and very good. Uh, I think that uh, we have got really a good number of people participating and a lot of questions for all of you. I'm, I'm sure that we do not have time to answer to all the questions that you do, uh, you did, but uh, I'm quite sure that uh, both uh, Kobe and Mikal will uh, take a chance really to send an answer possibly uh, to uh, everybody is uh, possibly in touch with us. But I would like to just uh, ask uh, two, three questions to both of you, if uh, you, we have still a little bit of time, uh, just uh, picking from uh, the different questions that we receive. First of all, there is a question asking whether uh, post pinastrid syndrome be, can be a vicious cycle of failed intercourse, causing then uh, more sexual insecurity, anxiety, depression, then potentiating erectile dysfunction, and loss of libido even more. So a typical case of psychological sexual dysfunction. So what is your opinion about this? Uh, I will say it very clearly. What you describe is a typical case of sexual dysfunction, psychogenic, or a, a vicious circle. And that's why it's important to understand when the sexual problem started. And that's why I said it's crucial to take a very good sexual history so when you started with medication or start with depression or start because of the BPH of the AGA and when the sexual dysfunction appear and how you break the, break the cycle and of course depression could be but depression is only one of the possible symptoms of PFS and that's why do we have now the criteria who say you need mix of uh, uh, symptoms who, according to the, the timeline and that's the differentiation between depression, PFS, PSSD, and so on. Mikael, any anything else to add? Yes, I think I fully agree. Uh, it, it, you have to understand also the moment that the dysfunction appears. So, for for some patient that is a kind of uh, for some patient that have a kind of a sexual trauma or sexual difficulties be before. Uh, the add-on uh, effect of medication or, or maybe also uh, expected effect of medication or maybe also the effect of suggestion for some cases may cause really great distress and they may very, very much focus on this condition. Therefore, the education is very important. We have to take this complaint very seriously and make a very deep investigation of that. Uh, and in, I, th I think in my uh, personal experience, so uh, in, when I uh, am taking an in-depth interview and uh, try to clarify the things, then patients start understanding what could really happen. 
Uh, in case of PSSD patient, I think they are even much more uh, distressed and uh, traumatized by this condition. And it's uh, quite uh, common that for longer that they are very much focused on the uh, pharmacological mechanism. And sometimes uh, if I can really see that it is not a typical case of PSSD, uh, it might take longer to uh, cut this vicious circle, circle that Kobe was talking about. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have understood the perspective of the patient. So uh, always take this complaint very seriously. Okay, thanks. Somebody asked whether you know if there is any research that has been done to consider these syndromes as autoimmune in nature. Autoimmune, there is no evidence. There was one theory from China, actually. And we don't, didn't find even other studies that published uh, any evidence for that. And uh, there was the thought, but not the parameters who can show it. And actually, there is no one PSSD study who checked uh, uh, autoimmune parameters in the CSF. So what we have is from plasma and not from CSF. And that's why we don't know it. OK, thanks. And another question is, uh, if there is any risk of persistent sexual dysfunction, and in other words, if all those these symptoms may be resolved after stopping the medication. So actually, this is the most common scenario when stopping the medication. Uh, the, the sexual dysfunction usually uh, goes away. Uh, for some patients, it might take longer. This actually, we can see this as a model in many of our uh, uh, premature ejaculation uh, patients as they, for instance, use paroxetine for longer and they may see the, the effect um, uh, is, is um, lasts for, for next uh, weeks or even um, months, but it's very typical that the condition comes to the previous phase again. And this is actually the same. So in the most common scenario was the dis disappearance of sexual dysfunction. But for some cases, we really don't know what the exact epidemiology of the problem is. We perceive it still as a relatively rare phenomenon. Uh, the condition may last for longer. And if it lasts for more than three months, we will call the condition PSSD if it meets the proposed criteria and yet that makes the situation much more difficult. Thank you. Copy anything else to add? No, I totally agree with uh, Michael, uh, my, uh, Michal. This is the most uh, prevalent situation, but unfortunately there are a small group of patients because uh, uh, SSRIs are used in tremendous amount. The third medication in Europe and, and, and the second one in, in U US. A uh, small part of the people get those syndrome. Majority resolve after stopping the medication. And that's what is going about with this syndrome, only small part, which we don't know how to select them from the whole population of the patient who use this medication, finasteride or any other SSRI. Yeah, we still, we still don't understand the patient phenotype that would be, would be more likely to get this condition. And this is the problem if we could screen uh, before the treatment, uh, see any features that will predict uh, having this kind of dysfunction function, we, we might, of course, uh, avoid this or use another medication, but we are we don't have this knowledge yet. Well, I thank you really very much, both of you. I mean, your presentation were outstanding, as we were expecting. And uh, I think that uh, I need to, to say thank you. Everybody has uh, participated to this uh, webinar. Uh, just to remind that we will do a, another a session webinar on the 7th of July at the same time, 8 o'clock in the evening, all, always supported by IPSA. And thank IPSA very much for really uh, support ESSM in our educational programs. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening and take care, all of you. Bye bye. Thank you, Carlo. Thank, thank you. you, all the participants. Bye bye. bye. Thank you, everyone. Let me just remind you, as I wrote on the chat, to just take a few seconds to fill out the survey that will be provided when you log out. Thank you, and see you next month. Bye-bye.